Hi, this is Dr. David Shia, the Eye Physician and Surgeon in Irvine, California. And this is part two of your How to Care for Your Eyes, your Eyes Instruction Manual. Now, part one went over the four different types of refractive error and the importance of sunlight as the antidote for all the screen time. In this portion, we'll be talking about what's wrong with the visual system, different diseases of the eye, and how we can be preventive. What can we do about those things now, and also what to do if you do have those things. So trying to provide some solutions on how you can see better, how you better can care for your eyes, as well as protect them. Many different kinds of eye diseases can affect your sight. And the vision changes are not always evident right away. The big three, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts, can have various symptoms to look for. Uh, cataracts specifically can mimic some of the side effects that we normally see with LVC or laser vision correction. And so the question is, what can you do about those things and try to prevent these diseases, diseases from becoming problematic? With regards to age-related macular degeneration, this is a leading cause of vision loss in people over 65 years of age. It's part of the natural aging process, some of it is. After all, the macula, which is a specific part of your retina that is involved in central vision, may lose some of its effectiveness over time. Or abnormal blood vessels can grow under the retina, affecting the central vision. In early stage age-related macular degeneration, the symptoms can be hardly noticeable and may only occur in one eye. Now, the symptoms can include blurry vision, dark or empty areas of central vision, and that straight lines can look wavy. There's specifically a kind of tool called an Amsler grid, which is available on our website, by the way, that you can use as a self-screening tool to see if perhaps you may have some of these changes. Now, at this time, there's no good treatment for dry form of age-related macular degeneration. Lasers, photodynamic therapy, and injections may treat the wet form or the neovascular form of AMD. Now, again, with macular degeneration, dark areas may appear in your central vision as you're kind of seeing with the simulation on the clock. It would be very difficult, obviously, here to be able to tell what time is it. So on this slide, we can see an illustration of macular degeneration. Here the macula is shown here, which is the specific part of the retina that is involved in the central vision and where all the detail is basically processed. In the normal retina, the structure of the retina is preserved. Here we actually have some of the rods and cones that are part of the retina, as well as the outer nuclear layer. There's actually nine different layers formally to the retina. Underneath that, we have the retinal pigment epithelium. And underneath that, this is the choroid. So this is what is required for patients and all of us to be able to see normally. When you have the development of dry macular degeneration, you actually have these drusen, which actually develop underneath the retinal pigment epithelium, also known as the RPE. And this accumulation can cause degeneration in and of itself, causing the cell death or degeneration of the photoreceptors. Now, in the case of wet macular degeneration, what implies blood? And so here, the blood, it actually bursts through from the choroid and then fills this area. And then obviously, with blood inside of the photoreceptors, it's very difficult for the retina to be able to do its job. And so this can create the dark spots or the blind spots in the central vision. Now, I think more important is the question, what can you do about macular degeneration right now? So now, if you have a family history, then getting screened regularly is going to make a lot of sense. And it's up to you and your eye care uh, professional to figure out a good screening system there. And of course, it will depend on how significant their family history is, what your genetic profile is like, what your age is, and then also some of the other aspects that we're going to talk about here. One thing, though, you can do, though, is protect from UV. So perhaps that does mean sunglasses and or a hat. That's going to be a first good step. 
uh, diet and nutrition. You know, we are what we eat, and so it's going to be very important. Here we can see that a Mediterranean diet, which is shown on the right in the Mediterranean diet pyramid, to be high consumption of vegetables, whole grains, moderate protein, healthy fats, that this type of diet can confer a 40 to 50 percent risk reduction compared to not conforming to this diet. Now, we've also demonstrated that supplementation, specifically with a formula, uh, that's the AREDS2 formula. So AREDS stands for the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And the second part of that study there has demonstrated that uh, vitamin C, E, and zinc in particular may confer a 20 to 25% reduction in patients with mild to moderate dry macular degeneration. Obviously, that's very specific. So that's why I think that for most people, this idea of the Mediterranean diet is going to be something that is very good and perhaps very sustainable and can be done really at pretty much any age. And so dietary prevention is really a key component of prevention right now. Now, also, we think that exercise is a big part of that as well. So emphasizing the UV protection, the diet, and the exercise in terms of what you can do right now for macular degeneration, whether or not you have it or not, or whether or not you have a family history. Now, glaucoma is another leading cause of blindness in the United States, especially for older people. Now, this is a disease of the optic nerve, usually associated with increased intraocular pressure. And when that occurs, that can create blind spots in the vision. So when the optic nerve fibers are damaged, blind spots develop. And these blind spots, unfortunately, can go undetected until optic nerve is significantly damaged. Now, some of the treatments, eye drops, laser surgery, and or conventional surgery may be required depending on the type of glaucoma and its stage. The good news is that there are newer and better techniques in surgical devi devices that can help control glaucoma better. However, we, are, we know that early detection and treatment are the keys to preventing vision loss in glaucoma. So with this glaucoma illustration, we can see here that the normal optic nerve actually looks a little bit like a donut. And so the cup is really the hole inside of the donut. Whereas the disc itself is actually this, this is the donut substance, as it were. Now on the right, we can see how the donut hole is significantly bigger on this side here. And the rim or the disc area there is really thinned out. So it's almost as glaucoma is sort of eating away at the nerve. And that's a good way to think about that. Now, the only thing that we know how to control really for glaucoma is really the pressure. And we do know that pressure when it exceeds a certain threshold, which is probably different for each person there, causes direct damage to the optic nerve over time. Now, the typical reason why that occurs is that there's a buildup of the fluid inside of the eye. And so not enough fluid is basically exiting the eye. Sometimes that can be a result of the iris literally pushing up against there in narrow angle types. But in the more common open angle glaucoma type, it appears that the angle is open, yet it's not draining. And that probably is because a lot of the blockage occurs in the area of the trabecular meshwork. Now again, in terms of what you can do now for glaucoma, if you have a family history, then getting screened regularly is going to be very important. And again, this is something that professional society as well as your eye care professional will be able to help you figure out what is a good schedule for you for, for screening prevention. But there are plenty of lifestyle choices that can help to prevent or slow down glaucoma. And you'll notice the theme. Some of it is similar to macular degeneration, eating a healthy diet, probably a very similar diet to what we had just gone over there. Also a sustainable diet, exercising safely, but possibly limiting hip stance. That's like another important point, exercising, but exercising safely. Limiting caffeine, sip fluids frequently. So yes, you do need to drink water, but perhaps not too much at once because perhaps all that fluid volume might cause for pressure to uh, be relayed to that optic nerve. Adequate sleep, quantity and quality are very important. 
There was a meta-analysis that suggested that sleep apnea confers a 1.6-fold uh, increased risk for glaucoma. Uh, relaxation techniques. And then, of course, if you are taking prescription medication for glaucoma, please take the prescription medication as you're instructed. Now, diabetes is another major cause of vision loss. And diabetes mellitus is the inability of the body to use and store sugar properly, resulting in high blood sugar levels. Results in changes in veins, arteries, and capillaries in the body, including the eyes. And damage occurs to the fragile blood vessels inside the retina. This can cause symptoms of blurred or decreased vision. Now, the treatment for diabetic retinopathy is usually laser surgery, but sometimes now it's actually injections, sometimes implants, and occasionally conventional surgery. But prevention, it's the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so if you can really prevent diabetic retinopathy, you're actually much better than trying to treat that there. So you can significantly lower your risk of vision loss by maintaining strict control of your blood sugar level and making frequent visits to your ophthalmologist. Now this is the whole spectrum of what can occur with diabetic retinopathy. So kind of coming over here on the upper left, this is an example of the changes that we see with non-proliferative background diabetic retinopathy with significant fluid leakage uh, and macular edema. So here, the red dots here represent the retinal hemorrhages. And some of the microaneurysms are basically uh, dilatation or enlargement of some of the veins. Now, unfortunately, what occurs with this is that you can actually get some seeping of some of the cholesterol and lipids out into the retina. Now, if you get swelling of the retina, then that area of the retina does not work very well. And so that can actually lead to small relative blind spots actually in the vision. So now, proliferative diabetic retinopathy is uh, more advanced. And here we'll see the growth of new blood vessels. Now these new blood vessels are never as good as the one that you're born with and they have a tendency to leak and bleed. But basically when the retina doesn't feel like it's getting enough blood supply and oxygen, so it'll send factors saying, hey, you gotta give me some help. And so those factors can cause for these new blood vessels to grow. And then the fear is, is that if these leak and bleed, then that significantly increases the chance of severe vision loss. Now, what is typically done with that is applying laser. Now, with laser, what you're really doing is you're selectively burning parts of the retina, really. And so that's not ideal. Uh, here, this is analogous to basically amputating. Okay, so it's not like people want to have limbs and toes and so forth amputated, but if it's going to become gangrenous or it's already dead, then we may need to do that to save the other parts. So here, what we typically do is with uh, diabetic retinopathy, we'll apply laser in the periphery there to basically help preserve the important central vision. Here's the macula, here's the optic nerve. We're trying to preserve these areas because if that doesn't occur, then you can see with proliferative diabetic retinopathy with retinal detachment and extensive scar tissue, it should have been done, and now we have a situation where it becomes very difficult to treat, that even with surgery, it becomes very difficult to basically try to save the remaining retina. So this is after vitrectomy surgery has been done to remove scar tissue that caused retinal detachment. So uh, basically an, another situation where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So then what can you do? If you want to prevent all those terrible things from happening, then again, if you have a family history, getting screened regularly. And in this case, it's not just at the eye doctor there, but also with your primary care physician, having a good partner to help you figure out what's going on with your body. And that's also going to be depend on your age and stage, et cetera. Now, straight from the American Diabetes uh, Association website, you can see that the first things would be to maintain a healthy weight, get more physical activity, eat healthier, get plenty of fiber, eat whole grains, and don't smoke. So this screenshot was taken directly from the American Diabetes Association website, emphasizing those same things, increasing the physical activity, eating healthier, not smoking. So this is good. These are the ways that you can actually help to lower your risk. And this is again for everybody, not just people who have diabetes. So now commonly 
I get questions regarding what actually constitutes enough exercise. And so this slide is actually inferred from some of the information from the American Heart Association. So the recommendations for adults is 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity or a combination of both. So this seems very nebulous. So I think I like this a little bit better. Again, this is also from the American Heart Association. But if we really look at it this way, it's showing us that walking 30 minutes five times a week uh, is equivalent to running for 15 minutes five times a week. So kind of showing that moderate exercise and vigorous exercise are really pretty much equivalent. So people obviously you know, starve for time, a little over an hour of exercise doesn't seem like it's that much. Uh, here, this is about two and a half hours for sure. That does seem like a lot more, but it's important to spread that out over the course of the week rather than getting it just one day. So adding moderate to high intensity muscle strength activity, weights or resistance, more than two weeks, uh, two days per week, excuse me. Spending less time sitting, being active for at least five hours per week, and then increasing amount and intensity gradually over time. So exercise is really a cornerstone for healthy heart and also healthy eyes. Now, what constitutes the recommendation for kids? And again, this is straight from the American Heart Association. So children three to five years old should be physically active and have plenty of operators to move throughout the day. They shouldn't be chained to a device which we know clearly is not gonna be good. Kids that are school age, six to 17 years old, should get at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, mostly aerobic. So we're talking about things like running and soccer and hopefully being outside so they can get their physical activity as well as get some of that sunlight that we talked about in part one. So that vigorous intensity activity, at least three days a week, and also that muscle and bone strength and they weight bearing activities on at least three days per week. Um, also the guideline to increase amount of intensity gradually over time. You don't want to do too much at once. So now we finally come to cataract, which is one of the other major causes of vision loss. Age-related cataract is the most common form. So the eye's normally clear lens becomes cloudy. Okay, and that prevents light from focusing sharply on the retina. So it basically helps block it. It's not the cornea. A lot of people think that it's actually a clouding of the cornea. That's different. This is behind the color part or the iris, which is where the lens is. And so the symptoms can include blurry vision, glare or sensitivity, port night vision, and yellow or fading of colors. So now there are no drops. There's no pills that will basically make the cataract go away. Okay, so the only treatment right now, the definitive treatment, is surgery that removes the cloudy lens and replaces it with an artificial lens, uh, intraocular lens implant, also known as an IOL. So now if the cataract symptoms are not adversely affecting your daily activities, you may not need surgery. Simply have eyeglass prescription changed as needed. I like to kind of think about the cataract in this way. It helps me understand what we can do about it there. So um, also understanding how we can help to prevent and slow it down. So a lot of that comes down to lowering free radical damage. Quitting smoking or not smoking at all is also very key. Smoking, as you probably well know, basically ages us on a molecular level. And so uh, all those 400 odd chemicals that are actually contained within cigarette smoke can be very damaging. Now, wearing protective sunglasses and a hat when outdoors can be very helpful. Eating a low calorie, nutritionally complete diet, also helpful. Avoiding risky activities that can result in trauma is also helpful. And then if you have diabetes, maintaining control of blood sugar. Now, this is actually the way in which we actually grade cataracts. Okay, so we'll start out on this left-hand side. And this is how we are all when we are born. And what's interesting is, is that the actual molecules that make up that lens, okay, those cells have been there since embryogenesis. And so when you were born, those lens were proteins were actually there. So what happens over time is that they basically get cooked. Think about the effect of 37 degrees Celsius, the UV and so forth, and hence as it cooks, it basically goes in one direction. 
So don't make it too complicated. I like to think of all of this, the changes in terms of the lens is a little bit like when you actually cook an egg. So you take a egg out of the refrigerator and you've got basically clear, flexible protein. Okay, and as it cooks, you can see it starts to go a little harder, less flexible. That's what it means when you have presbyopia. And that's when you actually need reading glasses. So if it continues to cook, then it makes sense that it starts to turn white and then the opacification starts to interfere with your ability to be able to see. So this is a really good way to think about the cataract is basically kind of this cooked egg analogy. I really like this sort of hard boiled egg analogy because we've all seen an egg get cooked. And so, but it also helps us understand what can we do to help to prevent it there. And anything that helps to slow down the cooking is a good thing. Now, preserving good vision does require a partnership with an ophthalmologist and or medical professional. Uh, importantly, in infants and young kids, they should visit an ophthalmologist or other medical professional at the following intervals. Newborn to three months, six months to one year, three and a three and a half years of age. Now, these other medical professionals can include pediatricians, family physicians, nurse practitioners, or physician assistants. So a lot of these folks have very high-tech ways of actually doing the screening. So see, there's some of the different technologies that have actually been uh, purported to help these medical professionals actually do some of that screening. So not every single kid actually needs to see an ophthalmologist per se, may just need to see their primary care physician. Now for an ophthalmologist, once you get older, uh, this is the recommendation at this point. So between, if there's nothing else going on, you don't need glasses, et cetera there, then probably between the ages of 20 to 29 that you should see an ophthalmologist at least once during this period. Certainly those with a risk factor for glaucoma, people of African descent, or those who have a family history of glaucoma should be seen about every three to five years because perhaps glaucoma could start during these early years. Now it makes sense that as we get older, we'll need to see the ophthalmologist more often. So in the 30s, at least twice, twice during this period. Again, folks with risk factors for glaucoma should be seen about every two to four years. And during the ages 40 to 64, the recommendations even without any other problems there, about every two to four years to try to keep a handle there on things that only we can see. Okay, and then over age 65, every one to two years. So uh, I like the slogan by some of the optometrists, which is see clearly, check yearly. Certainly that's gonna be true for anyone over the age of 65. Now a good way to do some enhanced screening, and certainly we have this capability in our office, is with the so-called OptoMap. And this really facilitates early protection from vision impairment and blindness by getting this done. It allows us a really unprecedented view. We have a 200 degree view, uh, also known as an ultra wide field view. This can help to detect life-threatening diseases such as cancer, stroke, and cardiovascular disease, but also early signs of eye disease as well. So a lot of the things that we had just talked about, such as macular degeneration, glaucoma, will be able to get an early sense of that. And as we had noted, many of those diseases are much better treatment if we're able to detect them a lot earlier. So early detection and treatment means less risk to your sight and your health. Additionally, this is fast, safe, and comfortable. Uh, however, as a screening tool, if it's considered a screening, the OptiMap, then it may not be covered by your insurance there. Now I'd like to kind of spend a few moments highlighting the difference here is that the OptiMap really gives us a, a really unprecedented view to the eye. A 200 degree ultra wide field view gives us approximately 80% of the retina basically in one picture. Whereas without the OptiMap, you're really getting it at that as only 45 degrees, which is only 15% of the entire surface area of the retina. So it's quite a bit different there. This is a short history of the retinal viewing as well as imaging. The first time anyone was actually able to see into the eye is in 1851, when the first ophthalmoscope was invented by Hermann von Hemholtz, and that gave us about a 10 degree field of view. By 1926, the first candidate fundus camera basically gave us a 20 degree view. 
It was the invention of the binocular indirect by Charles Sheppins uh, in 1945 that gave us a 30 degree view. And then by combining some of those views, we were able to create a montage. The ETDRS is the early treatment in diabetic retinopathy study. And so in the 1970s, we could get about 45 to 75 degrees of a view, but this was requiring multiple different pictures to be able to look in. In 1997, a wide angle lens was finally able to give us a 130 degree view, but really it's in 2000, uh, that the Optos Ultra Wide Field came into being there that gives us the 200 degree wide field, uh, giving us 82.5% of the retina in basically one picture. It's non-contact, non-invasive, and just takes about a half a second. So the Optos in its earliest incarnation wasn't really at a really good state of resolution. So it was the Optos California with the higher resolution that came out in 2014 that really helps us as ophthalmologists really be able to detect a lot more disease. And I would say that really is the threshold for it being actually better than our own naked eye. And that makes sense. You know, you don't think of, of that, um, but say for example, an astronaut looking down from space, they can't see your house, but we take it as a given. We actually have access to satellite imagery that gives us uh, a view that is going to be better than what our own naked eye. Now the future, now that the Optimap has been acquired by Nikon, is going to be processing this image perhaps in the cloud and having the application of artificial intelligence to many of these images. And so even before somebody actually looks at them, it could have algorithms that detect glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetes. And so these algorithms are currently being refined for um, common use, just like facial recognition is actually performed on any of the photos that you actually upload automatically into the cloud. So it can be very, very powerful, a great adjunct to see where the technology is and will be going to. Now this is a comparison of the fields of view that are available with the Optimap. And so you can really see that a 200 degree image uh, is quite amazing in terms of what you can see. So here's the optic nerve, here's the macula, uh, there's arteries, there's veins. You can actually also see some of the choroid as well as the retinal vessels. The conventional fundus camera, uh, which does need to be taken typically with dilation, gives us only a 45 degree view. Whereas when we actually put our head, head strap, um, the binocular indirect, the little device that you sometimes see on our heads, this indirect ophthalmoscopes only give us about a 30 degree view. Whereas when we're actually looking at the optic nerve using the slit lamp, it gives us a very, very small, very limited, but highly magnified view. This is another example of what you can actually see when we dilate and we take a conventional picture of the eye, the fact that this patient actually has diabetes changes in the periphery there. And so, uh, of course, this image is courtesy of Optos, but I think it's a very good one to help understand how the technology can benefit you. And in essence, the, the essence of being human is really using technology to make our lives better. So we need to be using the technology intelligently to be able to help us be healthier and better. And so being able to early detect disease is a good way to do that. Now I really like this story. So the story of how the Optimap came into being, this gentleman is actually the inventor, Mr. Douglas Anderson. Okay, he's an engineer. And when his then son was five years old, because this is his son in modern times. So when he was five years old, he went blind from retinal detachment, his son Leaf. So if we actually look very closely at the picture there, you can actually tell that he's wearing nearsighted glasses there. So fairly thick and he's actually holding a book. So he probably was very significantly nearsighted. I also like the kilt, it does tell you Scottish. Now actually, if we look very closely at the upper image here, you can actually tell that um, pretty much this eye is looking straight up at us. Okay, so this one is actually looking a little bit up. So I suspect that it's the right eye that in fact is visually impaired. Now his feeling was with the Optimap exam, Leaf's 
detached retina might have been detected in time to be properly treated and his eye could have been saved. So in essence, all these doctors basically missed his detachment there. And the brilliance of the OptiMap is really understanding that instead of taking your direct picture, is that if, instead of trying to peer in, you know, you essentially have a keyhole problem there, is that if you have an eyeball and you're trying to fit a big camera uh, right up to the eye, then you're going to basically keep hitting the cornea and you can't get it any closer than that. But if you actually turn the eye essentially into a projection and then reflect it off of a mirror, then you're actually able to construct just this beautiful image uh, that is both high resolution as well as wide field. So now in summary, let's kind of bring this together. In terms of how to care for your eyes, a lot of this does come to, to having common sense. So really important, preventing injury, because at this point we don't know how to regrow eyeballs. There's a lot of things that we don't necessarily know how to regrow. And so preventing injury is really key. And so um, we've also talked a lot about how being outside is really important. Again, the minimum is about two hours a day, every day. And so, but if we're going to be outside, we're going to want to wear protection. So hat, sunglasses, perhaps sunscreen is all going to be important. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of hydrating, drinking enough water, eating healthier, exercising, getting enough quality sleep, avoiding toxins and stress. A lot of this stuff seems self-evident, obvious, um, but it's really, really critical. These are the foundations. And so if you don't have a good foundation, really forget about anything else. Oftentimes I see the folks that actually have the red eye, and if the red eye is as a result of not getting enough sleep or not enough water, well, then what am I going to be able to do? That makes uh, it very difficult for me to be able to fix the problem if it's something as basic or foundational as that. Now, this was kept a little bit deliberately vague. Perform eye and eyelid care at least twice daily. This really means kind of wash your face sort of thing, but some people need to actually detail out your eyelashes there, depending on whether or not they are prone to different eyelid hygiene type problems. Uh, we also know it's important to go to the doctor regularly according to the schedule that we actually had just put out, as well as screening on a regular basis uh, according to the recommendations of your eye care professional. And then last but not least, certainly, being happy. It's a very critical part of living a good life. So this concludes the second part of the eye instruction video manual. We're all only going to get better if we all know and do better. I hope that this information has really helped you know better, and that translates into doing better and being better. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this has helped you.